Okay, so now in week 10, we're going to move on to emitters and detectors. These are things we've taken for granted in the lab. They've just worked for us, so we're going to look at them in greater detail. And the photo of the day is probably some of the first early man-made emitters after fire, the light bulb here. Okay, you've got Thomas Edison. And then you're seeing today more of these LED light bulbs, which it's interesting. You've got this advanced technology in here, but they still have the retrofit to the same infrastructure used for an old-fashioned light bulb at the end of the day. So today's lecture is not really optics, but it's on devices we use in optical systems. So again, we're getting a little bit out of the main focus of this course, but if you don't understand emitters and detectors, then it's kind of hard to build a sophisticated optical system. So this is for completeness in your understanding and ability to build up optical systems. So topics related to emitters, we'll talk about mechanisms for light emission, we'll talk about absorbance leading to fluorescence, we'll talk about devices that emit light, and the optics of LEDs. And then detectors, we'll focus mainly on the type of detectors and we'll do a little bit of performance comparison. So in the future, if you need a detector, you can figure out how to select the right detector for your project. So I'm not going to go through this in detail because we've talked about this before, but we, you know, we had talked about how a photon is created and we used the example of a dipole antenna, maybe in the gigahertz regime. And the key point was that we had moving charges, time varying moving charges, which gave us a time varying magnetic field. And remember, a photon is just a time varying sinusoidal electric field, a magnetic field. And so once you get this going, this charge movement, you can create a photon. So there's a couple ways to create photons and we'll review that briefly here. For those of you that are electrical engineers in this course, you've taken semiconductor devices and you understand that you can create photons through electrons and holes recombining in a semiconductor that has a direct band gap and there's your charge movement, right? And so that creates an electromagnetic disturbance, creates a single photon for every single electron hole pair that recombines. Other sources include atomic sources. For instance, take all of these in their gaseous form and excite them with a high voltage that creates a lightning bolt, which is basically a plasma. And then you could take the electrons, which are orbiting these atoms, and kick them up into higher energy orbits. And when they relax back, the charge moves and it creates an electromagnetic disturbance in the form of a photon and gives its energy up in the form of a photon. So you can see all the different energy transitions in here that are possible for these atoms going anywhere from the low energy in the red to the higher energy in the blue. And then look at neon here. Red neon signs, you can see all the colors that are out there and why it dominates that those are, are ma mainly red. And there's also emission from molecules. So we've talked about semiconductors single atoms, or um, in this case, a molecule. And in molecules, you're not looking at electrons orbiting the atoms themselves, but you're looking at electrons orbiting the molecule. And so with a molecule, you have something called molecular orbitals, which are kind of like the pathways for electrons as they can move around through the, uh, the molecule. And what you have is, when you have this, you could kick an electron in one orbital, let's say it's going like this, to a higher energy one as it orbits around this. And what you get is an energy transition between a higher energy state and a lower energy state. So in this case, the highest mo occupied molecular orbital means that's the ones that are occupied with no energy. And then you could kick it up to the next state, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, meaning the next available state that you could do that. And then when you just let this relax, it'll come back down and it could emit a photon of light because again, you're moving a charge. It's interesting too, I think I mentioned this before, that if you look at molecules, this is a blue emitter, this is a green emitter, and this is a red emitter. You can see that the energy of the photons emitted decreases as the molecules get bigger, right? Red wavelengths of light have lower energy than blue. And the reason why is you can treat these energy levels like a quantum well. If you make the quantum well bigger, making the molecule bigger, then the first energy level shifts down in a quantum well if you, if you do the calculation in quantum mechanics. And so that tracks nicely in terms of emission from molecules based on their size. Let's look at molecules that emit light in greater detail because they're frequently used in medical imaging, chemistry, and we're going to be doing experiments with them this week so you can kind of understand where these emissions come from. So, we know that with light emission, energy is always lost, okay? 
and therefore you're transitioning between two energy states. So we know that has to happen. For a molecule, the energy states can also have different vibrational modes. So even within that mode, there are many different energy levels. And so if you go, the, the PowerPoint has a nice animation, but this, this can't capture with this uh, video capture approach here. But if you do a wiki search for molecular vibrations, you'll see all the different ways a methylene group can have molecular vibrations, which can give you multiple types of energy states. So for example, here's, silk, here's carbon dioxide. There's a carbon dioxide laser, it's an industrial laser used all the time for welding and other laser cutting applications. And you can see that these are energy states here, but there's different energy states for all the different types of ways that you can energize the, uh, the CO2 molecule. So for example, there's an asymmetric stretch, that's these energy levels, there's a symmetric stretch, and there's bending. So you can see in this case, the outer atoms in CO2 are moving back and forth, and in this case, they're moving and kind of oscillating back and forth this way. And so you can get transitions between these multiple states. So as a result, when you get molecules, and you look at the emission spectrum, it can be broader and there are lots of potential emission spectrums. It's not as well defined as maybe just a standalone atom or a semiconductor. So, look at this in a little bit more detail. Let's look at an organic dye, which would be fluorescence, like orange rhodamine, which is shown in this photo here. So this is used to, they used a dye to stain um, mitochondria, of a mitochondria of a neuron and they stained it and then they basically shined a fl um, on this a shorter wavelength light that caused the dye to fluoresce and so they could see it under a microscope. Okay. Well, here's the rhodamine molecule here. And what you have is, because it's a molecule, you have a lot of energy states, okay, which makes sense because you have all these different ways, you know, things can twist and turn and vibrate, okay. But also, even beyond the vibrational aspects of this, when you have a molecule and you stick it in an environment, such as in this case the cell might be surrounded by water, all the other molecules and charges around it can interact with it and basically shift the electrons in their position and in their energy levels. So things get broadened out. So look at the emission peak from this, uh, from this rhodamine here. It's actually pretty broad. You know, it's like 100 at, at, at half maximum is easily 50 nanometers wide here. And that's, again, because you're putting it inside a material and the energy levels are disturbed and shift a little bit by interaction with the other charges around the, uh, the molecule. If you looked at rhodamine in isolation as a single molecule, it would be a very sharp emission peak, not broad like, broad like this. Okay. The other thing I want you to notice is notice how the absorption peak and the emission peak are shifted from each other. This is something you will always see in light emitting device, devices where you can shine light on it that's absorbed and cause it to re-emit. You always see this thing called Stokes shift, which is the difference between the peak of the absorption that leads to the peak of the emission. So this is the absorption of wavelengths that will lead to emission. So the absorption right here at 525 nanometers would be very strong. That would be the best place if you wanted to excite the rhodamine and shine a laser on that and have efficiently couple the photons for exciting it. You would do it there. And then you have a little bit of energy loss because you're going from a higher energy photon to a lower energy photon. And this would be the peak emission. Okay. And again, the absorption has a broader profile, too, because this is inside a medium where it's interacting with all these charges around it. So that broadens out the absorption, too. Also, when you look at this, see if you can see more than one peak. So can you see more than one peak for the absorption profile here? Well, you should be able to see it. What you have is basically a superposition of, of several peaks. So let me draw it here. Here's a, I can see with this little thing, there's a peak there, which is probably superimposed on another peak here for the absorption profile. Hence why you get this little bump right here. And so you can already see how you get an averaging of multiple ways that this thing can absorb light, which gives you the overall response here. Typically for organic materials, if you go out into the UV, the absorption profile peaks up again as you go into the UV. So when you go to shorter wavelengths, almost all materials start to absorb a lot in the ultraviolet, sometimes resulting in the emission as well. A little bit more on light and molecules. In this course, we will deal mainly with visible and UV absorptions. This is electronic transitions between energy levels. Okay, 
inside the molecule, so the electron orbital changing. Now, if you look at thermal infrared wavelengths, the absorption at that point in the emission is due to molecular vibration. So that was where you had those the parts of the atom vibrating in different ways. And then when you go to microwave and far infrared, the emission and, and absorption becomes due to molecular rotations. Most of these are absorptions, though. It's difficult to get emission for these, okay? but it can happen, too. But again, microwave and far IR, it's molecular rotations instead. So here's a question for you. Why is a microwave oven 2.45 gigahertz? What would be special about that? And if you're trying to answer this, this is the same reason why submarines cannot do radio communication when submerged and why they use sonar instead of radar. Well, the reason why is that a microwave oven, this resonance is an absorption that is used to cause a molecular rotation in water. And so most food that you want to heat has water in it, right? And so you use that to basically resonate and absorb with that molecular rotation for water. And of course, that's why you can't do radio or sonar or, or radar communications for a submarine when it's submerged because the water absorbs most of the bands. And so, you know, with that too, you're like, well, there should be some places I could get transmission through the water, right? Because, it, you know, I just pick a frequency that would not line up with water's absorption spectrum where there would be an absorption peak for a particular rotation. But, again, if it weren't for molecules interacting with each other, the emission absorption would be narrow, but it's actually broad because they interact with each other. So see these plots here. This is absorption versus wavelength without broadening for maybe a single molecule. This could be water. And this could be out in the frequency of, of let's say, gigahertz frequency. When you bring a bunch of water together, they all interact, and then the, free, the, the, the spectrum broadens out, and then you really lose the ability to try to find windows where you could get transmission through a lot of the water because you always have some absorption. If we're talking about light sources, we should also talk about black body light sources. Black body radiation is simply when you heat something up. So a classic light bulb, that's black body radiation. Okay, And it, it's, if you take semiconductor uh, or, or quantum mechanics, it's basically building up a lot of the vibrations that can have enough energy to build up to create a photon. So the phonons are the vibrations. If enough of them work together, they can all give up their energy and create a photon instead. And that's the vibrations of the uh, atoms in the material themselves. The neat thing about black body radiation is it's very smooth. So this is the amount of radiation that's being emitted versus frequency. Here's the visible spectrum right here, and this is wavelength up here. And you can see it peaks out in the visible spectrum when you get to around 6,000 degrees Kelvin. If you go to 1,000 degrees Kelvin, most of it's out here in the infrared. The interesting notes about this is that it's very inefficient. Look how much is useful for the visible spectrum. Most of it under the area under this curve is out here in the infrared, so it can't be very efficient. But the other thing that's nice about black body is the emission is very smooth. You get it over many, many wavelengths. And so it's particularly useful when you want to do some kind of surface and detect or measure color or an optical system where you want to have all wavelengths of light going through the optical system. So it's difficult to beat black body radiation because it has such a broad spectrum giving you all these different types of photons. So at this point, uh, do a bit of review, take a break, and then we'll move on to the next section.